And so if you would, again, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 30. I'm going to read verses 1 through 6. And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire and had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, neither great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captives, Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Let's pray, most gracious Heavenly Father, God, again, we get to come back tonight and worship you once again as we lifted up our voices in song and praise, giving thanks to you and honoring you and praising you. For, Father, you are worthy of all praise. But, Lord, I pray that you would speak to us tonight through your word, that we might be challenged, that we would be encouraged and strengthened. But, Father, it's a work that really only you can do. And, Father, I pray that you would meet that need according to your great wisdom and your will. Father, thank you for your goodness. Bless this time. Give me those words to speak that you might use. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What should I do when I've had a bad day? Maybe several bad days. I'm sure you've all had a bad day. I've heard people say, how are you doing today? Well, it's not so good. I'm having a bad day. Well, there's no such thing as a bad day, just a bad attitude. That's what I was told. And many times it's really as simple as that. Uh, our days could be much worse. But it's not as we maybe have planned out for ourselves. Nevertheless, troubled times do come into our lives. A day might not be as we think it should be. Maybe it's two days. Maybe it's a week. Maybe it's a month. Uh, the time is really unimportant. Because sometimes even within a day, we can become discouraged. And we cannot allow that to keep us from doing what God would have us to do. As believers, we have no real right to allow ourselves to become depressed. We might come, become a little discouraged. I think here with uh, David, as he came and these men that were with him, they loved him, they followed him, and they turned on him that quick. But of course, if you just lost all of your family, they were sold off and captured, your sons and daughters, your wives, everything you own taken from you, uh, it might change your attitude pretty quick. But it doesn't take long for things to turn, and that's what happened here. They were ready to stone him to death. The man that just the day before they were willing to follow and give their lives for. And he had those, his best friends, turn against him. Now that's enough to discourage anyone. But we see the solution that he gives us here through this account. He encouraged himself in the Lord. Too many times we try to encourage ourselves, and there are things that we can do, and that's what we're going to spend some time in this evening. So what do we do when we have a bad day or bad days? And the Bible tells us that help to overcome a bad day or bad days like David does begin or should begin with encouraging myself to the Lord. And then it can be accomplished by, I think, I first remembering some things about our Lord and what we have in Christ. That we need to remember the greatness of his faithfulness. In Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22 and 23, though I'm just going to read a couple words of this. Uh, I won't have time to go through everything that I have scripture for. But he says, he abideth faithful. 
even in on our unbelief, even in our lack of faithfulness, he abideth faithful. That's his nature. That's who he is. That should encourage us to know that he will remain faithful in spite of our circumstances, in spite of whether we may turn against him like the soldiers turned against David, though they love David. But for that moment, they turned against him. And there are moments where we love our Lord, but there are times that we turn against him, don't we? We even turn against him with our words, sometimes with our actions. And in spite of our lack of faithfulness, he is faithful all the time. We need to remember God's joy and his comfort. And I would have you turn to 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. <clears throat> First John chapter 4, verse 18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We need to remember that we can be comforted in his great love. We can have joy in his love. His joy, not our joy. That's also spoken of in John chapter 15 from that God of all comfort and consolation that tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 3. We need to remember God's joy. We need to remember his love. Remember that he is the God of all comfort, the God of all consolation. When we are discouraged, knowing we turn to him, he is faithful and we can have his joy. We know that Jesus wasn't pleased when he had to hang on the cross at Calvary for us, but I'm sure he had joy in his heart. He did the will of the Father. And therefore, knowing that he does all these things for us, and we too then can have joy even in the difficult times of our lives. We also can remember his past victories. If you look back on what God has already done in your life, you can look back to those times. Why would he deliver you and give you victory a year ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, yesterday, and not give it to you today or tomorrow or next week or next year? In 1 Samuel chapter 17, 1 Samuel chapter 17 Verse 37, David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion, out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, go, and the Lord be with thee. David looked back to the times that God delivered him out of those dangerous times. And he said, because he's done that, he'll deliver me again. And if he doesn't, well, we'll be with the Lord. But he has given us victory and deliverance many times in the past, more times than we can probably count. And so why would he stop? Even sometimes when we lack the faithfulness that we should have for him, because he is faithful. We need to remember his past victories, and that should encourage us. We also know in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 54 through 57, I know you're all familiar with this, but he has given us victory over death and sin. Think about that, what he has done for us, that we don't pass away as Christians from this life separated from God forever. We get to be in his presence forever and go to that place with him where there is no more sin, no more illness, no more deception, no more depression. He will allow us to be in his presence. He has given us victory over death and sin. We need to remember as well that he has given us victory over the world and the devil. And it talks about that in 1 John chapter 5 and John chapter 16 and 1 John chapter 2, that he has overcome the world. 
Yes, we deal with the devil every day. He knows what buttons to push. Uh, I know frequently I say that uh, it's not just me, that many pastors resign on Mondays. I had a Monday like that last week. And uh, it took a little while for the Lord, to, for me to get my mind off of me and back on his faithfulness, his victories, his joy, his faithfulness to help me get back on track. And I think it will help each and every one of us if we keep that in our minds as well. He has overcome the devil. The devil has already been condemned. He's just waiting for the day to happen. And because of that, uh, he's pretty busy doing everything he can to destroy the relationships that the believers have with our Savior. He can't keep you from being saved or that you'll lose your salvation because we can't. But he sure can influence us to hinder our relationship with our Lord. And we have victory through Christ. And we need to remember that as we take courage in the Lord and not in ourselves. We should remember that we have access to our Heavenly Father directly in prayer. We can go to Him through the accepted sacrificial blood of Christ. We have the right to go to our Heavenly Father with our petitions. Just as Caleb said, give me that mountain. We can go to our Heavenly Father the same. Lord, you made, you promised me that you would take care of me that you would deliver me. Now, it may not be the way that we think it might happen, but nevertheless, he will fulfill his promise and we can go to him. That We should not be irreverent as we do it. But we are a part of the priesthood of the saints and the priests were the ones that went for the people uh, to God. And we as priests have that same access. In 1 Peter 2.5, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. And I'm going to begin reading in verse 4, verse 4 and 5 of 1 Peter. To whom coming as unto a living stone disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. I think sometimes we forget that we are a part of the priesthood of the saints. We don't act as though we are, and we are. There is a right way to access God, but we have access to him, direct access through Christ. And there are many people take that very lightly. I think of it even when you think of the priests and how they had to go to God and how they were to be uh, cleansed and how they, they wore certain articles of clothing. There was a right way to go to the Father. And sometimes I think we've cast that aside. Well, it's a new day and age. We don't have to be like that. Well, maybe if you view yourself as part of the priesthood, you might uh, reevaluate how we come to the Father to worship Him, how we go and address Him. And we should remember what He's done. He has given us that access to Him through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. We didn't earn it. It was given to us through what Christ has done. We can also need to remember because of Christ that he intercedes on our behalf, it tells us in Romans 8, verse 34. Christ is speaking for you right now. I know I use this first often, and it's because we need to be reminded that he is active every day of our lives. Jesus just didn't go on the cross and die for our sins and come off the cross, was buried and rose again the third day and sits on the right hand of the Father. He is actively interceding for us daily, sometimes minute by minute. That should give us comfort in difficult times. Even in his prayer for his disciples, 
that he had in John chapter 17, verses 20 through 26, talks about that. He wasn't just praying for his disciples right then, but for future disciples, for us. We were already on the mind of Christ over 2,000 years ago, and he prayed for us. He interceded on our behalf. Matter of fact, let's turn there. John chapter 17. John chapter 17. I'm going to read verses 20 through 26. Neither I pray for these alone, speaking of the disciples that he was praying for, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. That should encourage us right there. That the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them. Boy, doesn't that encourage you right now? He's saying, I love you. And he wants us to know that. As thou hast loved me, Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them my name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Are those not words of encouragement? To know that Christ not only prayed for us, but he speaks of his love for us, and prayed the Father that he would love us as he loved his son, that should encourage us even in the most difficult of times. We are also can be encouraged in the Lord because he has given us his Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit in Romans 8.26 tells us that he intercedes on our behalf and he utters those words that sometimes we don't even know what to say. We may not even really be able to think them properly. In Romans chapter 8, Verse 26, likewise, the spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings, which cannot be uttered. Have you ever had those times that you wanted to go to the father and you just struggled for what to say? But the Holy Spirit will utter those words for us. And there are times that we may not even be able to rightly put the words forth. I, I don't know about you. I can, I remember those things just in the last week as I pray. And it's like, Lord, I, I don't know the words to say, but he knew my heart. As wicked as it is sometimes. And the Holy Spirit interceded on my behalf, uttered those things that I needed to say, but didn't know how. We can be encouraged in the Lord by those things. Remember his faithfulness. Remember his joy and comfort. Remember the past victories that we've gotten through Christ. Remember that we are of the priesthood of the saints and that our Savior makes intercession on our behalf and the Holy Spirit intercedes and others utters those words that many times we struggle with. And if that's not enough, remind yourself that you can encourage yourself because your sins are forgiven. I think sometimes if we just think about that, can be enough to help us through those difficult times when you think that because of what God has done through Christ, that we can have forgiveness of sins, that our guilt is gone. God loves us through Christ and we're forgiven of all of our sins, past, present, and future. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 13, Colossians chapter 2, verse 13, <clears throat> 
And you, being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. God doesn't select this one and this one to forgive. Because of what Christ has done, he has forgiven us of all of our sins. I don't know about you, but that encourages me that my sins are all taken care of. It's not because of anything that I've done. It's because of what he's done. And yet we allow ourselves to become discouraged. But knowing what Christ has done for us and that our sins are forgiven forever. And he has given us redemption and forgiveness of sins, Ephesians 1, 7. So and as we encourage ourselves in the Lord, we also can help encourage others. You know, it's those times that we're discouraged, that maybe we're a little down. Those are really the moments that we should encourage others that are struggling. Because when we're down, we take our focus off of ourselves. And it encourages Others. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Because our sins are forgiven through Christ, we know that Jesus' righteousness is imputed to us. And that word imputed means to ass uh, assign or ascribe from one person to another. He has imputed his righteousness to us. Just as our sins and our transgressions, our transpass, trans, tre, trespasses, I'll, uh, I'll fix that one day. Uh, as those are not imputed to us, they are not assigned to us. He doesn't hold us to account for those things because they were taken on him and he has imputed his righteousness to us. I don't know, how can we not be encouraged? That's why it's so important to go to the Word of God when we're down. But you know what? If you're like me, you sit in your favorite recliner and you whine and you complain and you murmur about all those things going on around, and we really kind of forget that we just need to encourage ourselves in the Lord and what He's done. He's forgiven us of our sins. And because of that, They've been removed as far as the east is from the west. And we can have peace with God. And we know that we can have eternity with him as well. That should encourage us. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. The Lord put away King David's sin. Yet he had been uh, chastened. And there are times God allows chastening in our lives because we're his children through Christ. We need to remember that, yes, we need to be dealt with at times, but our sin has been taken care of. It has been removed. It was put on Christ, just as King David. And he, though he was a man after God's own heart, we also know that his sins were probably in some ways much greater than our own, if you want to put them on a scale. Just because our sins have been forgiven, there still are consequences. Of course, there are consequences to every action in our lives, good and bad. Nevertheless, we can be encouraged that our sins are forgiven and forgotten. I was talking to uh, Lori the other week as we were talking about uh, doctrine, Bible doctrines, and I said, you know, there's a verse you need to get a hold of, probably more than any verse, to me anyways, any more or more than just about any other verse in the Bible. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Oh, I exercise that one sometimes several times in a day. That's why it was given to us. Because if not, we will stay discouraged. We will feel guilty and resentment. 
We need to claim that promise to confess our sins. And he is faithful even when we're not. And he will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, that our relationship with him can be healed. We don't lose our salvation, but we do hinder our relationship. That's why it's important. Don't wait to the end of the day to get right with God. When he convicts your heart about it, deal with it right at that moment. Because the longer we wait, the further we move away from him. And I don't know about you. I believe you're the same as me in this. We want to be as close to the Lord as we can possibly be. And we need to do that. He will forgive all of our sins, but we have to acknowledge them, turn them over to him, and he'll forgive us. He does that for his namesake. We can also be reminded that I can encourage myself that the adversary, Satan, is already defeated. You've already overcome the wicked one in 1 John 2.13. He has already been dealt with in part in this life. He's already been condemned. We have the power necessary to resist the devil and he will flee, the Bible tells us. The Bible know, or the Bible, the devil knows when we're discouraged. And you know what? That's an open door for the devil to come in and push your buttons. And he knows what buttons to push. And unfortunately, he don't have to mess with them too much. For me, I'm such an easy target. He knows me so well. And it doesn't take a lot. And that really disappoints me in myself that I'm such an easy target. And why? Because I allow myself to be influenced. Because I don't claim some of these same promises that I'm preaching to you today about encouragement, that we need to encourage ourselves in the Lord. If we would deal with those things, as I've already spoken and we will speak of some more, we could head ourselves off that discouragement nip it in the bud, so to speak. But many times we don't because Satan gets to us first. And he tries to discourage us and he does a pretty good job of it. But we need to remember that Jesus is greater than Satan. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Speaking of the false prophets and antichrist, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Sometimes I think that we forget that our Savior is greater than the devil. He was a created being. Jesus was not. He has been with forever, without time. And the devil was created, but he has been given great power, and we need to resist him. Sometimes I think we forget in our daily living how dangerous the devil is. And many times we forget that we're serving the devil more than we serve God. Because you serve one or the other. If you're not serving God, you're serving the devil. There's really no middle ground. You're bringing glory to God or you're working for the devil. You may say, well, that's not right. I'm very neutral. Well, you know what? Being neutral with God is being against God. And I'm afraid too many times we're neutral when it comes to God, except maybe Wednesday night and Sunday. What about the other days? We need to side with God on all things, even the things that we may not like, we may not agree on. How many versions of Bibles have been made up because people don't like some things? And they change, well, let's take that out. We don't need the blood in there. That's just, oh, that's terrible. Well, without the blood, there is no remission of sins. Without the shed blood of Jesus Christ, we have nothing. But yet, well, we can remove that. That's just so offensive. We need to be careful with those things. The devil is in all of those. The devil even uses, and 
it's it's sad that we have gotten to a place. That's why it's, uh, well, it's sad. I just remember when the NIV was in its heyday that uh, there is a great attack among the brethren from different versions of the Bible. And instead of coming together by the things that we can agree on, we use a version of the Bible to put others down. And there are some pretty bad versions out there. Uh, But God, I believe that the devil uses those things. Some of the men, I, and I, I, you know me, I am a King James guy. But I know some really great Christians that use other versions of the Bible that are good Christian men and women. And we allow those things to divide us. Pastor Jason was talking this morning about the division in churches. And that uh, there are many small churches under attack by the devil because the division is being sown within. Now, that's not a work of God. It's not a work of the Holy Spirit. That's a work of the devil. The devil doesn't stop outside those front doors when we have church service. He comes right on in with us, especially when we have a bad attitude about things. When we have a bad day and we're discouraged, we bring the devil right in with us. And then we, as we grumble to the people around us, we try to uh, pass the devil off to others. And it causes problems. We need to be careful. The devil is real and he is active. And too many times, instead of serving God, we end up doing the devil's bidding. Even sometimes when we don't realize we are. We can be encouraged because we have victory over the world and the devil by faith in Christ. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. The world is already beaten. Satan is already condemned. And that should give us some peace in difficult times, even when we're in attack by the devil We're told that in James 4, 7, that we simply need to resist him and he will flee. Now, those words are very easy, and it's a lot harder to do. But simply, we need to acknowledge that he is real and that we can't give him any place in our lives. I think of, and I I know I say this frequently, but I start, I think of Halloween and things like that that may seem so innocent in a way, well, kids dress up and and they get free candy and all that's a lot of fun. Well, yeah, but there's other things you can do. But there's so many things Satanism comes in through those ways. The devil isn't anybody to fear. He's just a little guy in a red suit with a pointy tail and a pitchfork. That's how I used to think of the devil when I was a little kid. So there's nothing to be afraid of. And you get to that way and we become desensitized. The devil is real. He is dangerous and he hates you. He is our adversary. And he can put on the light of an angel, but yet he is dark and he is death. But we have victory over him through Christ. We can't let a bad day ruin what could be a good day because we can encourage ourselves in the scriptures. As we're going through even tonight and looking at a few things to help encourage us, that should be the first thing that we do. It should be the first place that we go to when we recognize. Sometimes it takes a little bit of time, but when we recognize that we're, we're being discouraged, that we just, we're sideways with the Lord that this is the place that we go, the scriptures. I think of 2 Timothy 3.16. I know you could all quote it. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. And that means to teach what is right. For reproof, which means to teach what is wrong. For correction, which teaches us how we can live by that which is right. And for instruction in righteousness, to teach how we can come from wrong to right. We need to go to the Word of God, and we can be encouraged, and we can be strengthened, and we can be taught, and we can be corrected. 
we can take this dirty world that we have to walk through and clean our act up. Ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. How can you remain dirty when you spend time in this pure, holy word of God? With the washing of the water of the word, Ephesians 5.26, the word of God is that cleansing force like water that takes away our sin that we talk about in 1 John 1.9. The word of God encourages us by cleansing us, reminding us of his wonderful promises. We sing about those promises, but yet too many times we don't claim them. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but with all temptation also make a way to escape. We've been reminded in his word that those difficult times when we're tempted, he is with us, and he won't allow them to overtake us. He will help us find a way out, but you know, that way oftentimes is in this book. Sometimes it's with the brethren. The word of God is one of the first places we should turn to when we need to be encouraged. When we have a bad day, we must also remind ourselves that we can encourage ourselves with a song. I don't know about you, but there have been some times I've walked into these doors and I was a little discouraged. And then we start singing them old hymns. And all of a sudden, that discouragement just fades away. A song is put into my heart. Matter of fact, uh, even from our choir practice, uh, I was then whistling a song as I was going through the building. Uh, it got stuck in my brain, and I had trouble, a little trouble when we went to the next song. The tune was from the previous song was kind of stuck in my head and took a little while. Uh, when we sing about the Lord and what he's done for us and who he is, uh, it needs to stick in our head a little bit, maybe even keep us up a little bit at night. We need to have that song in our hearts. We need to come to church when we're down and sing those songs. <laughs> and they'll become a song in our heart, and they'll encourage us. Music is important when used appropriately. It tells us in Psalm 33.3 that we're to sing unto him, praise our Redeemer. We see it in Psalm 40, verse 3, and again, I'm out of time, and so I won't go through all of these, but it will encourage us singing to him. That's why it's important for all of us to sing when we come to church on Sunday. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. He doesn't expect you to have a great voice. He just expects you to lift whatever voice you have up to him. And it doesn't matter what the people think around you, whether they like it or not. I know I've shared this with you, but uh, it's, it's true. When I first got saved, I was a little afraid, and I got the hymn book, and I sang into my hymn book. And then one day I thought, you know, I don't care what they think around me. Because I knew I wasn't singing to them, I was singing to my Lord. Amen. And it changed everything. My whole attitude toward worship changed. My mind was set for the preaching of the Word of God. We can be encouraged. And we're given many a biblical examples of that uh, throughout Scripture. We see it in Revelation chapter 5, verse 8 and 9, with the four beasts and the 24 elders, as they fell down before the Lamb and sung a new song. We're commanded to sing, to lift up our voices to worship Him. And finally, don't forget that we can encourage ourselves because our Savior is coming for me. I could say He's coming for you, but I know He's coming for me. We forget that sometimes. He's coming. It's going to happen. It's done. He is our great hope. Not that if it happens, but really when it happens. And because he's coming, when we are discouraged, when we are influenced by the things of this world and we just want to chuck it away and give up, 
don't forget that our Lord is coming again. And he's coming for his children that have received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That should encourage us. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in Jesus and you believe in God. There is comfort in knowing that he is coming again and that it's real and not just some fairy tale like so many will tell you. But we need to be watchful and patiently wait with expectation because he'll come as a thief in the night. But he will come. No matter how difficult things are, no matter what's going on in our lives, when we have a bad day or many da bad days, we should encourage ourselves starting in the Lord and being reminded of all that he's done, taking away our sins, forgiving us of our sins, giving us victory over Satan. He's given us his word. He's put a song in our heart. And he's coming again. The next time you're discouraged, think on these things.